Okay, cool. One, I'm going to start this by saying it is a thousand degrees in my dorm room. So I apologize if I take a thousand breaks and take a drink. They have not turned the air on in here and it's hot. But um, I'm going to start by introducing myself. So my name is Morgan Knutson. I am a senior here at WIU with a double major in environmental biology and zoology. After I graduate this semester, I'm going to be attending the University of Kentucky and I'm going to be getting my master's in entomology. This is what I'm going to be studying at the University of Kentucky is bark beetles and how to manage them. So my presentation is on bark beetles and how they impact the ecosystem and us. Um, on this cover slide, you see a mountain pine beetle. This is Dendroctrus um, ponderosae. And just to give you a little um, background on this, bark beetles are not a specific species of beetle. They're a larger category that has many, many species underneath them. So just to get started, I'm going to give you some background on these beetles. So bark beetles belong to the subfamily Spolitinae, which is now known as the true weevil family, and this includes ambrosia beetles. They have a very large distribution. They can be found from across the West, from Alaska to Canada, throughout the Rocky Mountain region, and the Southwestern United States. And each species of beetle has evolved to eat a very specific type of tree. Therefore, there's about 600 different species in the United States. They feed on the cambium layer, which is located just below the bark, and they breed and eat in the phloem. Here is a chart showing you the different types, um, well, some different types of bark beetles and their very specific diets. So mountain pine beetles, Dendroctinus ponderosae, which is on the cover slide. They eat different types of trees like lodgepole pine, ponderosa pine, etc. You have spruce beetles, Dendroctinus repentis, that eat Engelmann spruce. You have pinion ipis beetles, ipis confusus, which eat pinion pine. As you can see, their common name reflects their diet because scientists are very original. Um, yes, next slide. So this is just another little background because I know a lot of people haven't had any introduction on bark beetles. So if you look on the right-hand side, this is a cartoon um, explaining different types of bark beetles. They have the same sort of characteristics, same shape, some, sort, some of the same coloration. However, these are all different species of beetle. Notice how different their sizes are. And then if you look at the tree that's associated with the beetle, they have these different pathways on the trees and those are called galleries, which I will touch on in a couple slides. But this is how scientists identify which, beetle, which beetles affect which trees because they have these galleries that have the same sort of characteristics, but they have different designs and that's how they can tell which species is affecting which tree. So these beetles are about 1 16th to 1 8th of inch in length. They are cylindrical in shape. They, can, they are brown to blackish to reddish in coloration. And in general, females are smaller in size and contain less fat than males do. If you look up at the upper right hand corner, the tiny little beetles you see at the end of the arrows, you can hardly see them. Those are adult pinion ipis beetles and they range from about 0.12 to 0.14 inches in length. And mountain pine beetles are a little bit larger than that, ranging about 0.20 inches in length, while spruce beetles are even larger than that, um, ranging from about 0.22 inches long. These are two very different species of beetles. On the left-hand side, you have the spruce beetle, Dendroctinus rupinus, and on the right-hand side, you have the Douglas fir beetle, Dendroctinus subatuga. Um, take note, they have the same coloration, same characteristics. However, these are very different species of beetles. And like I said, how scientists tell them apart, besides doing some gene work on them, is by looking at the galleries that they leave in the trees. And just another little side note, if you notice on the beetle on the left-hand side, their antenna have that club at the end of them. This is a very um, strong characteristic of the beetle family Curculionidae. Um, these beetles are in that family and then they fall within the subfamily Spilitinae. Um, this is my last slide giving you some introduction because I know a lot of people haven't seen what bark beetles look like or have had any um, access to what they look like. These are all different species of bark beetle. The largest one you see on this is a black terrapin beetle. The smallest one you see on this is a southern pine engraver beetle. They sort of have the same coloration, same characteristics, however, they range differently in size. And like, again, I'll go back to the galleries. That's how scientists can tell them apart. They have very different galleries that they put in the trees when they destroy the trees or are residing in the trees. So just to give you a little overview of their life cycle, I'm gonna start at the adult stage. Adult beetles will migrate to trees. They bury into the cambium of this tree. They mate, and this is where they deposit their eggs. Adults and larvae create these horizontal chambers, which are called galleries, which is what I've been mentioning, in the tree as they feed on the phloem and the sap. And there's two different types of galleries. There's an egg gallery and a larva gallery. Egg galleries are constructed by adults and they're uniform in width because adults go in the trees, 
may lay their eggs and come out. And larval galleries are at right angles to the egg galleries, and they increase in size as the organism grows. This is because as the organism grows, they're eating their way out, and therefore the galleries are also going to increase as the organism increases. The larva overwinter and pupate in these galleries, and then the exit of the tree is root adults, leaving these holes within the bark, which you will see in a couple slides, um, ready to mate and start the next generation. And just another little side note, as they create these tunnels within the tree, they spread what is called the blue stain fungus into the tree, which clogs the xylem of the tree, and this is eventually something that kills the tree. The blue stain fungus doesn't affect the beetle. The beetle picks it up as it goes through the tree, um, as they go from one tree to another tree, and this is how they spread um, this blue stain fungus. Here's a cart change showing the life cycle. I do very well learning from pictures, so I figured that somebody else might benefit from this as well. So if you look at the parent stage, this is where I started to begin with. They crawl under the tree. They leave these egg galleries, which are uniform in width. They mate, they lay their eggs, um, they exit. The larval, the larva create these larval galleries at right angles to the egg galleries. They're increasing as growth, increasing in growth as they're eating their way out of the tree. They pupate, they overwinter in these galleries, and then they exit the tree, leaving these holes. Here's an actual picture of some galleries in a tree. The purple circles, you can see egg galleries. Note that they're uniform in width. And the yellow circles represent larval galleries. Um, note that they're at right angles and they increase in size like I was mentioning before. And these are the tree holes that the beetles leave when they leave to um, mate and find um, mates elsewhere. And you can see they're in the little tiny yellow circles. There's, they're all over the tree, but I just pointed those two out. So what does a bark beetle outbreak require? Well, the first thing it needs is an abundant and suitable large stand of trees. And this can be found in conifer forests that are located in Western North America because there's large, dense areas of trees in this area and therefore they're highly susceptible to attacks. Trees that are older, um, aged, or have been through a disturbance event such as a wildfire, harvesting, a flood, et cetera, are also more susceptible to outbreaks because their fences are down um, in comparison to younger, more diverse stands of trees. Another thing that is very common in this area is drought, and therefore trees in this area that have gone through drought are more susceptible to an attack as well. The second thing a bark beetle outbreak requires is a climate that favors beetle reproduction and development, um, and that is where high temperatures are. So high temperatures speed up the reproduction cycle and growth processes of these beetles because these beetles are ectotherms, which means that their body temperature is dependent on the environment around them. So therefore their life cycle and growth processes are very dependent on the environment that they're around. And so if they're in high temperature climates, their, their um, beetle reproduction and development will be more fast, will be faster. How do they find a tree? Well, they leave as root adults through those little holes and they fly until they encounter what is called a pheromone plume that has been released by pioneer beetles that have been in this area before. So the beetles that leave the area as root adults that are ready to mate, leave behind this pheromone plume that is going to attract other beetles to the area saying, hey, this is a good place. Um, these trees are basically weakened and you can, there's lots of phloem here and areas to leave um, your young. So when they find this area, these, this group of beetles will release an aggregation pheromone to attract an, a large amount of beetles to this area because this is a good area. They can do well here. And once enough beetles are in the area to aggregate the tree, once it gets overcrowded, they release repellent odors or anti-aggregation pheromones to tell the beetles like, hey, stop. We have enough beetles in this area, go elsewhere and attack elsewhere. Um, and of course they prefer larger trees because there's more phloem and more area to lay their eggs and have their young feed on. This is a picture of an Ipus engraver beetle. Um, they are making egg galleries. So these are um, beetles that are gonna go into the tree and mate. These specific beetles feed on pine trees. So what is the extent of damage that these beetles do? As of current surveys, bark beetles have decimated 46 million out of 850 million acres of forested land in the United States. If you take a look at the picture I provided on the right, the turquoise color is the percentage of undamaged trees. There is very, very little of that. So to some certain extent, whether it's 1%, 51%, 100%, these beetles have affected forests um, by decimating certain tree populations almost everywhere in the Western United States. When do we see these? When will these? When do we see these beetles out in nature? Like when would we encounter them? Well, like I mentioned, they overwinter in the larval galleries during the colder months of the year, so about September to April, and there's still damage done being done to the tree because they're eating the phloem within the tree as they're growing and pupating in this area. 
may become visible to us when the adults hatch and leave the trees in the warmer area of the months from about June to August. And this is a continuous cycle because they only die when they encounter extreme cold temperatures during the winter time. Because like I mentioned, they're ectotherms, so they're very dependent on the temperature around them. And they thrive in these warm temperatures. So if they encounter cold temperatures, this freezes their bodily processes. Their life cycle is about one year, maybe two years, um, but they usually only last about one year where they mate. And then after they lay their eggs, they sort of just die off of like natural causes. This is again a picture because it, I like, like I said, I learn best from pictures. So um, as you can see, they spend most of their life cycle in their larval stage where they're overwintering in these galleries and they're only um, visible through us when they become adults and they leave in the warmer months of the year to go find other areas to mate in. What are the effects on the biotic or living ecosystem? Well, one, they go into these trees and they eat the phloem and destroy the trees. So they're causing death of these large stands of trees. And certain species are dependent on these specific trees. And one, of, one example of this is Clark's nutcracker, which is a species of bird and red squirrels and their relationship with white bark pine. So these beetles came in, decimated white bark pine populations, and the red squirrels were dependent on it for their diet, and the Clark's nutcracker were dependent on it for their housing. And when the white bark pine populations got decimated, the red squirrel and Clark nut nutcracker population also um, was reduced because there wasn't enough area for them to eat on or live on. Another um, thing is that a lot of beetles are dependent, not just bark beetles, but beetles themselves are dependent on these trees in this area. So when these bark beetles come in and they decimate these trees, these beetles that are found in the soil around them are completely destroyed. And this is a problem that's happening a lot in areas that bark beetles are found because it's destroying pollinator populations that are very crucial to this area. Um, however, the bark beetles just overtake the entire area. Um, another thing that happens when a death of large stands of trees occurs, so imagine you're walking through a forest, it's a lot of shade. Um, when those trees die, it creates an open canopy and allows sunlight to come in. And this allows species that wouldn't be there normally to thrive in these areas. And one example of this is blue joint grass, and it's out-competing these spruce seedlings. So the beetles came in, they destroyed these spruce populations, and it allowed for birds to come in, other mammals to come in, whatever, that were carrying other species of plants um, in um, seed form and they dropped in this area and then it outcompeted what was normally going to be there. So this blue joint grass outcompeted the spruce seedlings which changed the ecosystem in this area. The species that are dependent on those trees are not there anymore and this is an ever-changing processing process as the beetles are continuing to increase and go into other areas. So this is a picture of an area that bark beetles have affected. Take note of how many dead trees are in this area versus how many live trees are in this area. Another thing that's occurring as these trees are coming in and getting absolutely decimated is that these are occurring in areas that a lot of wildfires happen. So if there's more trees that are dead in this area, they're not transpiring, they're creating no moisture, they're just dead pieces of wood. Um, this increases the fuel for wildfires to be more rapid and spread more rapidly. Um, and if you go back, you can see how easily that a wildfire is spread through an area where there's very little green tree that. Another thing that's occurring as the canopy is opening up, there's less tree cover, there's more sunlight coming in, and this increases the rate of snow melt in certain areas. And as the, the um, rate of snow melt is increasing, this is increasing the different waterways, riverways, et cetera, that are in this area, and flooding occurs. And this ruins the type of vegetation or animals that can be in this area. Another thing that's happening to the ecosystem is these bark beetles are turning areas of carbon sinks, where carbon would go to disappear, to carbon sources where carbon is produced. So imagine you have a large forest area, it's absorbing the carbon dioxide and releasing oxygen, but these beetles are coming in and killing these trees, and therefore they're not absorbing the, the carbon dioxide like they normally would, and the carbon dioxide is kind of just sitting there. So when there's less trees, less carbon dioxide is getting absorbed, and they're becoming areas of carbon sources. And that is what is being explained on this graph. So as beetle infestations decrease tree abundance, they increase carbon dioxide levels. And if you look at the line that has the squares on it, this is where the beetles are coming in and destroying the trees, and they're taking areas from carbon sinks to carbon sources. So what are the long-term effects of these beetles coming in? Due to climate change, um, increasing temperatures are occurring in certain areas, and therefore bark beetles are moving into areas where they previously would have died due to the cold. So as temperatures continue to increase, more forests will undergo these beetle infestations. 
And that is shown on this graph. So the, as continued temperatures increase, there's increased survival rates of beetles because they thrive in these warm temperatures. The brown line represents uh, minimal temperature, and the red line represents survival rate of beetles. And as the temperature continues to increase, the survival rate of beetles will also increase. How do we manage these populations? We have learned very fast that insecticides are not effective for these organisms because the beetles reside within these trees and therefore the insecticides cannot be put into the tree. Um, so a majority of the population that would be affected by the insecticides is not being impacted at all. Um, insecticides are also bad for the tree itself and for the other insects in the area. So it's something that very few people even look at anymore when they're going to look at bark beetle populations. The second thing that they have tried to do is cut down these trees that are infected or susceptible. But if you think about it, any tree that has gone through drought or flood or any sort of disturbance event is technically a tree that's susceptible. So it's very controversial because are you cutting down more trees than the beetles would actually destroy? There's no science, no map, no anything behind that. So they've definitely um, gone away from that management technique as well. What they've started doing is working with bark beetle technology where they use behavioral chemicals. And this was first discovered in an experiment done by Bate um, when he was studying the reproduction cycle and mating behavior of the spruce bark beetle Ipus typographus, where they discovered that this anti-aggregation pheromone that they send out when they're done mating and when they are telling the beetles like there's enough beetles in this area, go away, the two chemicals that are in that pheromone are ipsinol and verbenon. So what they've started doing is creating these um, synthetic ipsinol and verbenon chemicals and spraying them in areas where bark beetles would normally be at. So all the bark beetles are receiving is a signal that's telling them do not come here, there's enough going on. And another thing that's really big right now is working with gene silencing and RNA interference in bark beetles. And this is actually what's going on in my lab at the University of Kentucky. They're studying very specific species of beetles and how they can change their RNA and genes so that they're not sending out certain pheromones, that they don't mate at certain times to reduce the amount of populations that are in the wild so that they can naturally um, sort of kill off these beetles instead of using some sort of chemical. And that is my presentation. Thank you. And does anyone have any questions for me? Great job. Thank you. Let's give a little applause if we can. Thank you. Thank you. And as an audience, try to ask a question, even if it isn't uh, you know, maybe the most over the top question. I mean, it doesn't have to, this is something to help Morgan answer questions. It'd be fine. Mine's not really a question, but more of like a comment because I live back home across the street from a forest and I've definitely seen like little holes in trees and I'm really glad like you've explained it so well and included pictures because I am a visual learner and I can now like say, hey, this is from bugs and my friend taught me it. So really good job on that pres presentation. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to agree. Very well done. Uh, I do have a question, though. The blue fungus that you were talking about, uh, does every beetle spread the exact same fungus regardless of the species of beetle or the species of tree it's inhabiting? I can't give you a 100% um, answer on that, but from what I know is yes, it's the same fungus that's going into this tree um, and affecting the trees. In certain specific, like the western um, area, this is a fungus that is prevalent. Is this what you're going to be working on in Kentucky? Um, sort of, kind of. I go down there. I'm leaving after this class um, to discuss what I'm doing, but they think that I'm either going to do one or two things. I'm going to work on another species of beetle that they haven't worked on before and study the gene silencing in that, or I'm going to study um, RNA interference in the pollinators that are in the areas that these beetles impact. Oh, cool. Very cool. Anybody else have any um, comments or questions? Lindsay? <laughs> Just easy I'm good. I have one. Okay, good. Um, okay. What uh, you said there, it's a different species of bark beetle per tree. Do they know why like they've evolved to have that many different species or is there like, is it a pretty simple answer? I don't know if you know that answer. <laughs> 
I mean, different beetles, like they overlap. Not every, not one tree in, like is affected by one type of beetle. That's why they have to look at the different um, galleries to see which beetle is there. Um, but no, I don't have a specific answer to that. Uh, just using background knowledge, I would assume that these are the trees that are in the area that these beetles are at. So that's what they would eat at. Okay, thank you. If you see Daniel Potter at, at some point, be sure to say hello from Richard Musser, he'll, Caterpillar Sped. He should know who I am, though. Okay, will do. Anybody else? You should let him know that Jeff Nolan seems like he's doing really well, too, since he knew him and took a class with him. Okay, hello. Well, have a safe trip. Thank you so much, and good luck to everyone that's presenting. Yep, thank you. Let's see, my host again. Host of the